Okay, I, I see we have a small but distinguished audience So, uh, for this talk. Um, my name's John Welchman. We're going to do uh, have a conversation today in two parts. Um, I want to give a quick introduction, maybe uh, 30 minutes, 35 minutes, just on uh, the book, what's in it, the contents, some of the ideas. Um, and it's a crazy international network of uh, individuals and things. Uh, so I probably won't get through to the end of that. And then for the second part of our time together, um, we're going to have a Q&A with uh, Véronique Bourgoin, who's uh, sitting in the front here. It's one of the principal members of, uh, of the Royal Book Blog. So I want, first of all, to thank the many people who have been involved with the Royal Book Lodge uh, publication over more than half a decade of research, writing, pestering, creative... Oh, yeah. Sorry, let me just put this on full screen. Uh, where's the full screen button? There it is, play. Sorry, that's much better, isn't it? Yeah. Half a decade, then, of research, pestering, creative, incommunicado, wishful thinking, second guessing, and language turmoil. Just follow along here. Special thanks to the three principles, the prongs of the RBL trident. In the middle here is Yuli Susin, who is in Paris and sadly can't be with us. On the left and with us is Véronique uh, Bourgoin, who um, will join me for the Q&A that I mentioned um, in a few minutes. And on the right, Yasha Goffman, a behind the scene guy who is there behind the scenes. Thanks to Richard Hageman, uh, the program director, and Nicola von Felsen, the publisher at Hatche Kantz, who supported this project and produced the amazing book that we're celebrating today. And to DAP and uh, Scooter uh, Helgeson, who are putting it about, the designer of the book, Gregory Kadars, and to David Senior for programming today's events. Then, and most important, thanks to the RBL artists affiliates, some of them, maybe most, but certainly not all, listed in bold uh, on the right here. So my first meetings and discussions with the RBL were rather occasional. To be frank, I couldn't really understand what the RBL was or how it functioned. Looking back, this book arose in the slipstream of my attempts to figure this out. The historian in me wanted to know more about what seemed like a significant engagement with various avant-garde and neo-avant-garde formations, especially with the Situationist International and some of its former members. My interest in contemporary art prompted an inquiry into how and on what terms the RBL navigated between the practices of some 30 different artists in Europe and North and South America and generated both collaborative and non-collaborative work. I was fascinated by the disparate spectrum of material, generic, and geographical orientations that had been taken on by the RBLers and by their resistance to being defined by the standard languages and practices of group or collective affiliation. The book takes a stab, if you like, at all this by offering some answers to these questions or perhaps uh, better some notes on and reformulations of them. After four years of back and forth, including a couple of extended visits to Montreuil, broken up, alas, by the coronavirus pandemic, I can see quite clearly that the RBL isn't exactly any of the things I thought it might be. What I can venture, however, is that the questions it raised um, and discussed press up against some of the fundamental issues of our times. The radical reconception of materialities and bodies associated with renewed interrogation of the category of human, a continued mutation in the making, functionality, and aggregation of images, a libertine reckoning with the seductions of science, and the need to better integrate, care, project, and prepare for the necessary transformations of the future. Now, this is an art book fair, and there are books in the middle of the name, Royal Book Lodge, and the conception and creative realization of books by ones, pairs, and multiples 
of RBL artists stands at the center of their practice. So I want to start off by just really without too much commentary giving some examples of the extraordinary efforts over more than two decades in book publication by the RBL. Uh, the first edition, having been largely confiscated by prurient customs officials at the Franco-Belgian border in 1929, the Royal Book Lodge republished Kiki de Montparnasse, Benjamin Perret, Louis Aragon, Man Ray and Paul Eluard's very rude 1929, Cosa Nostra Experimentale, from 1993. This is the cover and pages from Susin's uh, Inuk Shuk, uh, Fabrique des Illusions, another uh, publishing sort of uh, nomination. Uh, and it was uh, finished in 1987 and finally published in 1997. Beginning with Inuk Shuk uh, in those years, the RBL and its earlier incarnations have published some 40 limited edition artist books, each offering an innovative amalgamation of artist-produced images, elaborately finessed design, exacting print techniques, and innovative and experimental writing. The catalogue of artist authors furnishes another overlapping cast for the dramatis personae of the RBL, with contributions by Bourgoin, Rhodes, Sotnikova, Gutzmann Stotir, Hauser, Butza, Auer, Armin, Kraka, uh, Jurjak, Kayaltov, Matri Krasse, Sarah Glaxier, and Daniel Johnson, but also by earlier avant garde artists and writers, as we just saw with 1929 but also including Ralph Rumney and Gianfranco Sanguinetti, as well as works by Jonathan Mesa, Andy Hope 1930, and Susan himself, all of whom have innovated sometimes profoundly in the staging of relations between images and texts, books and objects. Before, I guess, it became fashionable and then mainstream for galleries to produce huge, expensive tones about their artists and associated exhibitions, the RBL experimented with what Susin refers to as luxury samizdat, a commitment to high production values and an overlay of types as their books occupied a crossover space between publications, sculpture, and artifact, giving rise to a virtuoso form of limited, and I guess unlimited, editions. The quotients of exacting finish were, however, the end point in a production process that was always collaborative and often impromptu, as books were nudged into being during meetings, conversations, and studio sessions by way of happenstance encounters, or during the long dinners and drinking sessions that funneled the bonhomie and adventure of the RBL affiliates, who caroused and conversed in their own latter-day variant of the banquet years. The RBL books can be seen and read as standalone or individual published forms, but together they map out a network of exchanges and interconnections that function like the spokes in the RBL wheel. In a sense, the run of books is a generative operating system for the RBL fired up by a code that emerges from the reservoir of ideas and materializations deposited in the collection and archive. The relational matrix between these parts is animated by a number of shifting conceptual orientations. The cultivation of paradoxical relations between time and history, turning on borings or tunnels driven through space-time continua. The provision of various encoding strategies coupled with the imaginative projection of parallel worlds. Diversionary tactics and elements of refusal, for example, to be complicit in conceptions of space governed by what Susan refers to as device algorithms, or to adhere to ideological models or precedents, a modus operandi inflected by the culture of samizdat and improvisation, and the use of alter personae, stand-ins, elaborate fictions, and name changes. While it's never foreclosed on insistence or advocacy, the RBL operates under a designation that is itself diffident and opaque, thriving through forms of retreat from the languages and assumptions of the declarative. All this gives on to the geography of the RBL, which is interzonal, played out by immigrants and itinerants 
in the spaces between some of the most emblematic cities in Europe, Moscow, Warsaw, Berlin, Prague, Paris, Marseille, the lines of flight and modes of living between them leading more often than not through their suburbs and peripheries, Montreuil in particular, and parts of Prague, Praga Polnyok, Malpasse, uh, for example. With affiliates domiciled, temporary or otherwise, in Germany, France, Iceland, Austria, the US, Russia, and Paraguay, almost everything they generated separately and together was produced in transit, in hectic and unpredictable sprees of sojourn, stopovers, and drop-ins, improvised and untethered things that have generally come together for the RBL by way of an unstinting extemporary creativity. This impromptu constitution carries over to the relative amorphousness, even anonymity, of the RBL itself, which has tactically, but also haphazardly, retreated from the normal paradigms of art world visibility, and is in fact little known, as attested by our group here, right? Even though some of its associates are in fact well established and others even, quote, famous. Locative experience, especially of dislocation, fed back into the establishing parameters of the RBL, notably around the undocumented or sans-papier status of Susan following his emigration to Western Europe in the 1980s. Statelessness and being without papers informed and necessitated the shifting and occasional nature of Susan's early tinkering with new printing methods and his shuffle from one medium to another, beginning in the Berlin immigrant camp from where he started out. Susan's early work, making rubbings with a technique adapted from archaeology from the cast iron covers and plates laid down over apertures punctured by water and utility companies in the urban fabric in various European cities, bear witness to these vagrant circumstances. It gave rise to a kind of metal impressionism uh, and led to the RBL's first book, which we're looking at in Ukshuk, featuring 32 frottage-like drawings by Susan, uh, created in 1987, but published, um, as I noted, in an edition of 42, some decade later. This is De la Méthode, uh, which is um, a work by Yuli Susan, um, uh, published by Fabrique des Illusions in 1998, with a binding imitating a passport, and so sort of underscoring uh, these itineraries that I've mentioned. This is Last Ice by Véronique Bourgoin, in collaboration with André Butza, Silverbridge 2001, 30 photographs by Bourgoin, with 30 acrylic marker drawings by Butza. Here is uh, wandering or hiking through or to Anaheim, uh, made by André Butzer and published in uh, 2001 with 36 lithog lithographic drawings by Butzer. Sala, Salou Baba, Balas, and Chao Cacao by Kai Altov, Abel Auer, Armin Kramer, and Dorota uh, Jurjak, published by Silverbridge, uh, Silverbridge in 2004 with a text by Kramer, prefaced by Charlotte Kugel, alias of Yuli Susan, all text handwritten by Altoff. Matière Première, Silverbridge 2005, a single-issue journal documenting the publications and activities that have come out of Silverbridge between 2000 and 2005, with contributions from Butza, Bourgoin, Nadira Hussein, Hope 1930, Grems, and many others, including Jason Rhodes. The texts of this book were by Susan Gianfranco Sanguinetti and the German historian of the Situationist International, Roberto Ort. This is um, Jonathan Mesa's Dr. No, Silverbridge 2007, 104 pages with 100 lithographic drawings by Mesa. Uh, Dr. No, also sometimes called Dr. No and Son, deals in the elusive circumstances brokered by the character of Guy de Mos, purported son of Ian Fleming's villain, Dr. No, and Guy de Bourg, spiced perhaps with an alliterative dash of supermodel Kate Moss, born, according to the inscription in one image, 
around the year 827. The conception of the slippery figure of de Mos and his proclivity for invisibility, camouflage, and general evasion resembles the power of earlier charismatically shady popular cultural characters such as the mysterious villain and mad scientist Fu Manchu. Dr. No, Fleming's Dr. No clearly alluded to Sachs Roma's character in its pages. Or, more interestingly, the evasive criminal genius Fantomas, introduced by Marcel Alain and Pierre Silvestre in 1911. The famous image of a pensive, well-dressed, masked man holding a bloody dagger that appeared on the first Fantomas cover established his, te his, his territorial credentials as he seems simultaneously to crouch on and step over the horizon line and into the city of Paris, half a dozen times taller than the Eiffel Tower shown uh, behind his trailing leg. The emblematic cover image assumed an enormous importance in Par Parisian mythology and dreamology, as Robert Desnos put it, while the spontaneous poetry of Fantomas offered the first presence of a marvelous particular to the 20th century. It is surely the case that the shadow cast by Fantomas on the world and on Paris found a later corollary in the psychogeographical force fields of the situationists in which they too seem to have the capacity to float through and around a miniaturized Paris seen from above as a three-dimensional map. Using scale drawings, rounds of instinctive collage, and an entourage of ragged text interspersed with pictographs, rabuses, and emblem-like abbreviations, Mesa defrosts the hardened constructs of history in a flurry of seemingly disaggregated prompts, enabling readers of Dr. No to recalibrate the symbolic forms and fantasies of official power in order to circumvent the hypnotic state to which these apparitions may have reduced them. Daniel Johnson, I've come a long way just to see you. Silverbridge and Orbis Pictures Club, 2010, 28 lithographic drawings by Johnson, showcasing the artist's knowledge of Christian, historical, and pop culture references in the American way of life. This is Andy Hope, 1930, uh, Hinterden Hügen, uh, Silverbridge, uh, 2010, Over the Hills, Across the Hills is the translation. An artist's fictional autobiography, storyboarded in 29 drawings, paced, placed between two blocks of picture ar archives culled by the artist from the internet. This is Jochen Lempert's um, uh, Parandaha, a major contribution, he tells us, to the knowledge of language and nature exploring the ornithological origin of typographic signs. Twelve photographs by Lampert, heliogravure on copper, made by the Heliog Workshop in Paris. Here at the top, La Vie dans la Maison, Life in the House, by Sotnikova, 2013. On the bottom, uh, a collaboration between Sotnikova and Yuli Susin, uh, published by Magnet River um, in 2017. This is Goodney Goodman's daughter, unpronounceably porcelain volcan, with porcelain and volcano with the vowels left out. Uh, Book Lodge uh, publication from 2015 of 16 pages containing five original gelatin silver printed rayograms by Susan from the drawings of uh, Goodman's daughter. And here, Sarah Glaxier's Serpentine Illusions, also 2015, uh, by the Royal Book Lodge, a facsimile of 60 ink drawings and poems, handwritten by the artist on a booklet of 60 pages. And you can see its scale. This is IKM-12M by Susan, published by Magnet River in 2016, a technical uh, guide for IKM-12M devices used for modifying radio frequencies from the Rural Communications Library 
of the Soviet Union, published in 1976, with the addition of 98 photographs by Susin. Um, it also uh, features on the cover the secret communication system invented by Hedy Lamarr and George Antoy in 1941, gold embossed by the Atelier Martial in Paris. Now, all these books, and this is just a small sample, are give on to what I'll call the emergence of para-book form. This is books staged in relationship to other material and generic uh, interventions. For example, uh, sculpture. Sorry, these are still from the Susan IKM book. Uh, this is uh, perhaps the most elaborate and extraordinary of these works uh, by Andy Hope, 1930. It's called Summoning, uh, published by Silverbridge in 2009. The book contains a meticulously rendered a scale model of Hope 1930's signature sculpture of the same title, Summoning, along with a booklet of 16 pages with preparatory sketches of the sculpture. In a different dimension, this is Matali uh, Crasse. Um, it is a, it's called Bibliothèque Bateau, or boat uh, library or bookcase. Um, it's a display boat uh, designed by the French artist and designer Matali Crasse made in 2010 to showcase RBL editions, a cross between a cargo vessel plying the Paraná River in Paraguay and the fake mahogany furniture one might encounter in the sitting room of a Soviet immigrant family. Ceramics, of course, pass into and through books, but especially uh, in the hands of Jonathan Mesa. These are his ceramic books. Uh, published in 2010, a series of 27 that he made uh, in that year. There are appropriated books made over. These are um, seven books selected by Andy Hope 1930 uh, from duplicates of a set of Rondo Cubist publications uh, published in the Czech Republic according to the very specific regimen of Cubism that you actually find uh, in Prague and in the outskirts of uh, Prague in those years. They were collected by Susan between 2002 and 2012 uh, in, uh, in Czechia or the Czech Republic um, and then redesigned, augmented, changed by Andy Hope. Books also pass into exhibitions and exhibitions pass back through books. One example, and Veronique will uh, talk about this uh, with me in a minute, uh, perhaps give some other examples. One example is this on screen, Vrai ou Faux, True or False, from 2013, a view of the installation in Hamburg, uh, which happened uh, a couple of years earlier. Performance passes also into books. This is again uh, Véronique Bourgoin's Ship High in Transit, Silverbridge 2008, a series of Polaroids featuring a group with which he's collaborated numerous times, the Whole Garden, H-O-L-E, uh, in Montreux. And films pass into books, and books back into films. Many examples of this, um, but one here is by Matelie Crasse again, in collaboration with Susan, Voyage en Uchronie, uh, published in Montreux in 2015. A couple of views of that uh, project. These are some ex libris uh, designed by the RBL to sort of cap off this part of my discussion. I want to just quickly, if we have time before we pass on to the conversation with, with Vero, um, just sort of sketch some of the things going on in the chapters which you see laid out here. The first chapter addresses the, one of the primary contexts of uh, the Royal Book Lodge in the Paris suburb of Montreuil. All sorts of things went on. Tiny sprinkling of those things here on screen. And here is a reproduction of Frank Sinatra's painting, Black Square, helpfully annotated by Raymond Pettibon um, on the left with uh, Salaina Koulibaly and a friend from the Foyer Malia, 
uh, roughly the Malian sort of community center for Malian immigrants into Paris, which happens to be located directly opposite the Klein Piano Factory, uh, which acts as one of the headquarters for the Royal Book Lodge activities in the Paris suburb. Photography I will skip over because this is going to be um, something that Vera will share with us. Um, but here are a couple of images, starting with some of the early chemical and experimental images that RBL affiliates, um, particularly Anne Lefebvre, uh, Véronique Bourgoin, and Yuli Soussin made beginning in the uh, mid and late 1980s and continuing uh, for some five years. There's a chapter on film and video, um, and one can say here that beginning with the work on the left, Ministerium, shot in 1988, a kind of home movie produced in Berlin, featuring Susin's parents, Ina and Anatoly, and his younger brother, Dimitri, the film and video practice associated with the RBL includes more than 20 productions and very numerous other short pieces. Some of these um, have been almost throwaway, while others are unfinished or in progress. Others still are organized in elaborate collaborations and address larger historical or metaphysical questions. The locations, again, form a parallel psychogeography that shadows Susan and Bourguin's peregrinations from Berlin, Marseille, Budapest, and Poland uh, through to or uh, through to Los Angeles, the Czech Republic, Russia, Italy, Paris, China, and Paraguay. Their media and genres are similarly diverse, using Super 8 uh, amateur cams, Skype, handheld digital devices, and stop motion, and they offer dialogues with the genres of documentary, science fiction, fantasy, and animation. Their casts of characters are drawn almost exclusively from the two artists' immediate circle, and of Book Lodge Associates, uh, augmented from time to time by professional actors and um, technicians. The RBL projects also include what I'll call film objects, of which the most significant, perhaps, is the work on the right here, Susan's Violent Noon, first seen in the Magnet River exhibition in Curitiba in Brazil. You can't hear me. Yeah, okay, Su super, sorry. Um, I'll, I'll speak up as well. Good. Sure, sure. So, yeah, this work was first shown at the Magnet River Exhibition in Curitiba uh, in Brazil in 2013. This is uh, Bourguin and Julian Leslie's Normadrine, again, We'll talk about this a bit more in a minute, uh, produced between 2003 and 2013. Now, inspired by ceramics workshops um, of various situationist affiliates and forebears, particularly Asker Yorn, as you can see here, as well as by the installations of the Ukrainian artist Bogdana Borovitz, whose entire oeuvre was destroyed by Soviet censors in the late 1970s, commencing a tragic sort of misstep between Russia and Ukraine that uh, obviously is uh, enduring today. The RBL is planning to develop a ceramics laboratory in Albisola on the Ligurian coast of Italy in the Ernan Pachati Ceramics Factory, founded by Ivos Pachetti, a friend and collaborator uh, from the 1940s with Lucio Fontana. Here's a couple of examples of ceramics production. This is uh, Jonathan Mesa and uh, Yuli Susin's uh, Werkstandel, uh, and Andy Hope uh, in the middle and on the right, uh, Saturday City. Both of these were made in the studio Hernan and Pacetti in Albisola um, in the years indicated. Like other materially directive initiatives, the group's work in ceramics negotiated a series of confoundingly intermedia initiatives. Susan, for example, looked to the experimental studio photographs made by Merdado Rosso after he moved to Paris in 1889 to understand sculpture in a complementary relation to photography. But in Albisola, 
he reactivated the overlay and slippage between media using a stop motion technique to make first snow and then the image on screen here, keramic fog, manifesting the stages of the continuous transformation of the clay like an ultrasound which makes the unconscious or the dream of sculpture visible with the defects of the images accentuating the impression that the film might be a mode of medical imaging. That's a quote from the project description. Now, RBL associates have looked back to certain aspects of avant-garde history, not for the purposes of an organized revisionist engagement or even through acts of homage or celebration, but rather as a means of clarifying and inflecting their own interests and obsessions. One of the most consequential of these, turn, of these uh, moves, if you like, turns on a sustained rapprochement with the Situationist International and its aftermath, giving rise to the first publication of Ralph Rumney's The Leaning Tower of Venice, Silverbridge 2002, the delayed delivery of which in 1957 led to his expulsion by de Boer from the Situationist International and the invisibility of his manuscript for more than half a century. The leading Tower of Venice adapts and refracts the format popularized in Italy in the 1940s and 50s of the photo comic or photo romanzo that uses sequences of photographs coupled with inset typescript text to advance a story of some kind, often, as the Italian term for the genre suggests, a romance. Beginning with the title, in which the leading attribute of the symbolic architecture of one historical Italian city-state, Pisa, with its leaning tower, is cross-correlated with another, Venice, Romney reverse engineers the narrative and iconographic assumptions of the formats he's appropriated, so that the image texts develop not as a linear sequence of connected events, but through a kind of experiential drift as the protagonist of the book moves through and reflects on the spaces of the city. Now, the RBL has also negotiated more than two decades of dialogue and collaboration with Gianfranco Sanguinetti, who with Guy de Boer uh, brought the curtain down, if you like, on the movement with their outro anthology, The Veritable Split in the International in 1972, as well as to discussions with another of the original signatories of the founding of the Situationist Group in 1957 um, in um, uh, Liguria in, in Italy, Piero Simondo, which would lead to the acquisition of this um, extraordinary and important work, I think for the whole 20th century um, uh, uh, period, uh, it's called Axis of Exploration and Failure in the Search for a Situationist Grand or Great Passage. It bears two dates, as you can see on the verso, but was probably made in neither time frame, but in 1955, my research tells me never merely interlocutors with the vapor trail of the Situationist International, RBL, RBL affiliates helped to revisit and rekindle aspects of its unfinished business and posed a raft of salient questions about what aspects of its critical disquisitions might be carried over into the 21st century and on what terms and with what consequences. Just going to quickly finish uh, with the chapters without saying much. This chapter looks about navigations and questions and experiences of immigration, travel, relocation, tourism, borders, transit routes, neighborhoods, and exoticism. And I'll end with this chapter. Um, we won't get quite to the end. Uh, this is remote controls, electricity, magnetism, and other powers. And I want to suggest that RBL affiliates were interested not so much in the infrastructural potency of electrical apparatuses, pylons, turbines, generators, dams, even space apparatuses, as magnified in the photographic essays and mural projects of Soviet and other command economies, in which the powers of electricity are manifest in um, 
you know, direct and persuasive and big scale uh, projects. Instead, they were interested in what we might term the exostructural conditions in which the powers of electricity are manifest in micro or macro technological environments or in atmospheric, even cosmological conditions, or in which electricity might relate to other powers and effects, such as magnetism, gravity, or the energies explored in particle physics. The most obvious manifestation of these um, interests uh, arrived in several projects investigating boreal luminosity, including Susin and Goodman's daughters, Photogram Boreal, as they're called in French, and the meteorological phenomenon of ball lightning, or the boule de foudre. Present in several bodies of work and investigation over the years, these concerns also inform a series of photographs by Bourguin titled Clouds. Where are we with time? Sorry, I don't have a clock. Okay, so I will stop there with Vero's uh, cloud uh, image on screen and invite Veronique to, to join me. Um, and I will, while she's sitting down, skip ahead. There are all sorts of um, complicated uh, things here around clocking mechanisms in the universe that we will skip over. Um, I would note that part of the collection of the Royal uh, Book Lodge has been acquired by the Getty Research Institute and uh, forms the, one of the key backbones of their collection of situationist uh, documentation. Um, as you can see on screen, these are other manifestations of things in the archive. Sorry, Vera. Yeah. I'm going to get to no, your no, slides it's, in a minute. It's okay. um, a couple of chapters dealing with fiction and autobiography. Um, and I just want to show yeah, uh, a lot. the two final chapters, which deal with you know more serious subjects: the archaeology of violence, borrowing a term from Pierre Clastre, um, and his very interesting research, actually on the Guarani in Paraguay, where Susin did an extended project. It's quite an interesting uh, chapter. Sorry. Uh, and then the last chapter, which is here, um, it's about the possibility, it's called Pharmacy After Hours, and it's about the possibility that art can participate in forms of social remedialization, utopian though that might be. Vero, yeah. here yes. are some photographs from you. <laughs> yes, but there is so much to, to tell about all the projects, I think, you, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe, could we start with Norman, Norma Dreen, which is on the screen yes. here. This is, I mean, it's, it's a super eight and it's only 27 and a bit minutes uh, long, but it, when I saw it, it just seemed like almost a, a sort of epic uh, of a kind and, and po possibly one of the more important of the RBL film projects. Could you say a few words about, you know, how it came into being and maybe some of the casting decisions and performance decisions? And I noticed that it, it took <laughs> 10 years to make. Yes, it took 10 yeah. years to make because at the same time I was running a lot of projects as you, we came through really quickly, like uh, I was part of the collaborative project of Nomadenos Gallery and Transcontinental Nomadenos Gallery and, and through the school that we can talk a little also, a young woman and, and so. It took time but I had all my tools all the time with me when I was traveling at this time. So, And the film was made about a real... Uh, news I read about Sony who was at the time in 2003 uh, tried to figure out a ship that she can implant in the eyes and change the vision and I was so scary about this now it's, I think it's banal and I it, this was the base of the scenario and it, the scenario was right as a cadaveric ski with Julien Leslie and uh, so I proposed him, okay, let's go and begin the film. So we went in Napoli first, and we, we shot in Super 8. And it took a while, because after I told you I was traveling. And, and what it's, I think, the point in this film, it's also the way how we was working on the film. It's a little, in a way, a kind of, psychogeographic way because I always improve. It was not planifié, or the film was not planifié. I have all this personage with me, the, the white horse, the balloon, 
And uh, so we designed it as a film noir from the 50, uh, like a thriller at the same time, dystopic science fiction film, and also a very parodic way about the world separating two, two community. And so with the revolution at the end, and voila. Super. Yeah. Let's, I mean, you've got a lot of slides, so yes. I'm, I'm going to move through and these. And so. this is, yes, I want to point, because with this, that, that we was part, we were part with Yuli and also Anne Lefebvre at the beginning, beginning in the fine arts school in Paris, uh, but in the department who, who was, it, it, it was created by, the, by a woman, Leslie Hamilton, and this was very important, because in, in France at this time, I mean, in, in 1985, the fine art photography was not really defended by anyone except some pioneer. And so she organized a really amazing show in 1988. And we, we were part with Anne Lefebvre, Julie, and me. And this was also something very historic. And we, we, we were supported also by Jean Claude Lemani, who created also the the fine art photography department in the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, and he was following our work. So, so and at this moment also we we was we were quite obsessed with Yuli about find a way about printing process to invent printing process. When we met, he had this method with the as you say the frottage, and and also me, I was really. Uh, doing a lot of different methods as transfer photocopy with trichloroethylene or this kind of shitty things that now you cannot allow to do it, you know. And uh, yes, with ink and so. Should we move on? So, yes. And so, and after that, with this book, I want to, yes, this, I was obsessed with the transfer. And, and a friend of us, Jacqueline de Jong, she was part of the Situationist. She gave us a kind of dummy, original dummy, of um, film lit for a situationist time about the spiral. And, and so this also, this project really, really, really show how the material through all this collaboration go and contaminate all the artwork. And so I took this dummy and I took some film lit and I, I began to experiment in my lab with some picture and during many, some years, and after it's happened, my first artist book, really or not really. And also the title is also came from really a situation. So there is really something situationist in a way, in a lot of level of artwork that we produce. And this was a game that act in, in our house at the time in Montreuil by Gianfranco Sanguinetti, and it was to, Im to imagine the world separated into two categories, really or not really, and I took this for my first artist book. And, uh, and how you see in the, in the, there is a, for the special copy, there is a kind of salon, living room, where I put some magnet in really or not really that you can remove, and it's like a black square. And in fact, 15, Years after something, I, I, I did this project and perhaps really connect with my own house because I really, all my artwork is really connect. Like my house is like my body. I was living there. I was, we was creating there with all these artists was living there. I mean, from a royal book lodge and also I, I have a daughter. So all was really connect and I decided to, 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 to think about, uh, okay, now what is the communication space? What is my own life? And I recreate a kind of installation, a salon, a vrai ou faux, in real, I mean, not in real, in wallpaper, but it was a kind of reproduction of my own living room and the story beside this own living room with all this royal book lodge project. So I, I was using for this project all the material from archive, from... Um, from the artwork of all these friends. And, and so this is also a kind of reconnection with Willy or not Willy. Because I was playing as a curatrice, but I am not at all a curatrice because all the material was really just for friends. I was not looking for some other artists. And this black square began real work. 
and the living room became a real size. And so in different space, on the white cube, I, I really play with this concept. And uh, so, and, and after Vreo Faux, I mean, this was shown in the, the Musée de Rotterdam de la Photographie in 2013. And the book came out with Photohof that we collaborate really for many projects with them. They are based in Salzburg in Austria. And uh, as you see, it's a lot of material and it's always different. And for this project, for example, I also went in the, in the archive of the museum and I collect some really uh, crazy material from living room from the thirsty, from Michel de Clerc, for example, very mix with the furniture, like fantastic design and uh, searchy design. And so I... I'd, at the end, my own living room changed the form. And beside this project also, it was a reflection about now in our time with the technology. Uh, we have the living room in our pocket and uh, what, what's going on with the real work, with the materiality and the materiality is something that I am, I am really obsessed all the time in my work. And uh, this, this is also, I finally, I came back, finally I came back through a kind of performance I did to remove one of the installations, it was in Montreuil, and I removed all the artwork, and uh, with my, this performer burned the whole garden that we found together with my close team to perform, to act in video, and we remove, and we, in, in direct, we put, we put a mono, uh, we paint in black, so it came back to, to really or not really, this maniac things. And it's, it was a kind of ephemeral installation in the art center in, in Montreuil. And, and this is I did after in photo also to, 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 to test the materiality. And this is, there is no picture. It's about also the disparition. Disparition, yes. Yeah. Yes, disparition of uh, the picture with also the new technology. And so I test the materiality directly on, on the lab. There is only light, only paper, only chemic. And it's a series of the cloud, like has a black square also, has the magnet in the living room. And that also connect, of course, with Malevich and all this history. And this is uh, also questioning the materiality, the human and uh, its future. So it's about human, non-human. And this is a kind of last project I am, I am doing about uh, asking questions about our daily life and what, what is going on with the metabolism of living beside this. And so I transform Google in my lab and I invest, okay, what, what I am wearing what is beside this, this levis I am wearing in India, in China, and what is the toxic and what is the society beside. So I dress up a kind of cartography, like black economic cartography of the world. Of, and so, and this is uh, also beside this become some installation with this human, no human cyborg and an artist book. And, um, yeah. Can you say a bit more about the, the title, the periodic table of L, the common... Yes, of course, because it's a huge project. So it's, it's become also, I, 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 I did a kind of détournement of uh, the, the tableau périodique de Mendeleev. And I, and, and I organize all this collection, collection I collect through Google in this table. So it's, uh, it's showing like a tableau périodique of Mendeleev, it's kind of, yeah. And this is some of the picture I collect and after I retest the materiality with some different elements. It's in, in the left, it's a frozen water that because in the, in the edition there is a kind of tube with uh, frozen more water really, really that it's, it works and in the other, it's a kind of um, contact of a drawing of a kind of chemical formula that it's on this tableau periodic element. Yeah. 
And maybe just a, a, a final word about the extraordinary workshop, the Atelier yes. Reflex, yeah. that you set up and ran for many years. That, yeah. In fact, let me go on to this. I mean, this is extraordinary. Within the book lodge, there's a whole another nest of publications and books. Uh, these are they um, that are associated with this workshop or uh, school that uh, Veronique set up. Yes. Yes, and this was really like also in the 90, middle of 90, we, we just after the fine arts school, we decided to fund this private school and we was really autonom, we were really autonom and it, and at the end it was running like really famous person at the end, like uh, for example, this American filmmaker, Abel Ferrara was really the last one and I, I, I did my, my, um, my workshop for free because I, I didn't want, I want to stop it. But this is kind of, uh, yes, a big, big story because it's involved a lot of international net of artists, of students, of workshop everywhere in the world. And for example, from here, I want to introduce Eva because Bruce Kalberg and Eva was part of one of the projects I show in New York, in Brooklyn, outside your land. And, uh, and uh, yes, and, and this is, was also to, to show the, how you can deal when you are an outsider and Royal Book Lodge I think it's something like how you can deal when you want to not to take the official road but to take some yes more complicated road. Eva do you want to say the last word I think we're almost through but I mean just something about the you know the meeting of the Royal Book Lodge it came to LA many times actually but I know that you were involved in one of those collisions. Right. Yeah, it's still growing. Yeah. Super. Last image is the next generation. This is uh, Veronique's uh, daughter, Jeanne, who is a chanteuse in Paris, meeting with Bruce uh, Kalberg at the Whiskey A Go Go yeah. when she was very young. Yes. And a future note that correspondence uh, around these uh, matters um, is going to be published. So, yeah. work in progress. Yes, and all the archive of this school will go to the collection of the Bibliothèque Nationale end of the year. So, plus the work of, of Bruce Kalber, who was shown in Outside Around Project and Eva. Yeah. Super. So, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.